Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be discussing LGBTQ plus rights with a particular focus on the lives and rights of transgender individuals as seen through the eyes of Diego Miguel Sanchez, Director of Advocacy, Policy, and Partnerships at PFLAG National. So Diego, thank you so much for joining us. It is wonderful to have you, and I'm so impressed with your own arc, your own personal story. I have to say it is it is quite extraordinary. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, starting off and then let's talk about PFLAG, the importance of allies and this moment in our in our history as a nation and, and the world. But talk about yourself uh, just to give us some orientation about your own journey. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you for having PFLAG National and myself here with, with your show today. Um, first of all, it's happy pride, everyone, for part of the part of the world, part of the country. Let's not forget that many Southerners will be having it in uh, October and September when it's a little cooler. But this is pride. My background is um, I was raised in the Panama Canal Zone. I was born in Germany. I'm a naturalized, adopted um, immigrant, naturalized citizen. And uh, when I was five years old, I told my parents that I was born wrong. Uh, they left the room and that was in Panama and uh, my mother came back and she had that was the days where corporal punishment was still allowed and welcomed in every household um, so my mom came in with something in her hand and I thought I was going to get it and basically what it was was a magazine that she had rolled up that she unrolled and showed me and on the cover was Christine Jorgensen who is the most famous transsexual person uh, initially, that's the first one that everybody knew. And my mom said, I don't know if there are other people like you who are born a girl and know they're a boy, but this person was born a boy, grew up to be a man, and then eventually became herself. And that's happening now. So if it happens now, by the time you grow up, I think everything will be fine. And then I was duly socialized by my parents so that I was happy half the time and and just miserable the other half. But as I said in my congressional testimony, I, I had as many tutus as Tonka trucks, and I survived the former because of the latter. You know, it's it's so interesting to, to look at people's attitudes. I wonder sometimes why it matters to me how you feel about yourself. Why should it matter, right? I mean, if, if you feel a particular way about yourself, who am I to say that you have no right to feel that way or that, or that you can be prevented from taking action based on that feeling? Is there an answer for you? Because you've lived this issue um, and you deal with people like me, who are, you know, people who are not you, who are not in transition, who are not trans. Uh, all yes. Yes, and I'll say, um, I'll give you a current answer and then a reflective one. The current answer is that the Trevor Project just actually had a new national survey, a report done research, and showed that people who are affirmed by their family who are LGBTQ plus actually have less than 50% chance of attempting to die by suicide than those who are not affirmed around them. For myself, I think I had the benefit of being adopted and being disclosed as adopted. My parents always told me a lot of people just have children. We had to choose you. We had to work to have you. It was a, a it took a lot of effort and a, a series series of governments saying okay. And I didn't understand that until when we adopted my younger brother and I watched the process with him and the, and the agony of waiting to be approved. So that to me, I see it makes it better for people to see you for who you are. And, and it's affirming, it's true for everyone. Even if someone is dressed to the nines and they're going out on a date, they would like it for their date to say, you really look nice. It doesn't make them look nicer but it makes them affirmed in how they, how they are. Then I also think, you know, you've been um, involved in the political process. You were with Barney Frank uh, um, for a long time and you're still involved in, in everything is political nowadays. Um, if I look at different political philosophies, right? 
a liberal philosophy, what, what, what's today's called progressive, right? Conservative, or, or um, if you look at the parties, Republican or Democrat, or libertarian, I don't see within those philosophies a, is necessarily a, a judgment one way or another when it comes to someone's identity. Do you see that? I mean, how do you interact with people who are on the other side of, of this divide? Because in order for you to actually be effective, you actually have to build bridges. How do you deal with people who are um, just, they come from a different place, they come from a different knowledge base. How, how do you interact with them? Well, I, it's fascinating to me that my parents actually were accepting of me before before there was a P flag, which there was a P flag, a mom who marched with her gay son in 1972, and then in 73, the organization was formed. We're nearly 50 right now. For me, it's a model that I see expressed every day in P flag, and it is where you approach people through and approach them through an understanding of a common thread that everyone struggles with some part of themselves in terms of reaching out to society or being accepted even in community. And so self-acceptance becomes very important, but being safe is really the cornerstone right now that a lot of LGBTQ plus people have to engage in and really watch out for. So when I deal, most people that I deal with are not like myself. And that was more true as I initially was disclosing and, be, and identifying as trans identifying things of common threads that people have, whether it's something of an affirmation or a fear or an experience or a hope. One of those areas, one of those areas usually is where connections can be made. And that's generally how I do. I, I spend a lot of times as a trans person, my early life was about observing other people more than expressing. And so I tend to have a, a wider range of captured experiences of recollection and acute observation, not unlike others like me, but unlike an awful lot of people who live their life with lenses of privilege and unawareness of obstacles that may be right in front of others in their presence. Well, people just like me, right? I mean, I don't necessarily every day process the obstacles that I don't face. Right. So uh, all of a sudden I'm talking with somebody else who has different obstacles than I am. And it's an education. Do you ever get tired of, of being an educator of people like me who are uh, less knowledgeable? I will tell you my personal answer is no. Many in the community will say, however, oh, it's not my job to teach others. I think they get to say that because people like me took our beatings early. And I don't mean always literal, although many of the beatings were literal. I believe that it's an opportunity to be able to express yourself and explain community or self to others. I recognize that a lot of people do think it's a burden. I think it's an opportunity because I've had to live through so many decades where all you could do is be silent in order to be safe. So I know that my opinion differs from many like me, but I also have great reason for having that opinion. So you've also been sustained by allies. So let's talk about uh, PFLAG, because PFLAG is an alliance organization. It's basically uh, people who stand up for rights of, of friends, of sons, of daughters, of uh, people who identify uh, as neither, uh, neither of those genders. Um, so talk a little bit about how PFLAG came about. And also you talked about the, you know, the march of a mother, um, but uh, also how you see your mission going forward and, and your agenda going forward. Absolutely. So PFLAG was founded by a mom who was watching television one night in New York City and was watching the evening news and saw uh, young queer people LGBT, probably mostly at the time it was gay and lesbian, but there were others. And frankly, there were trans people who were either undisclosed or unnamed. Uh, but she was watching the news and saw these young people being beaten up. And then later that night, she got a phone call from the police and they, they had arrested her son and beaten her son. And um, they said, ma'am, do you know that your son is a homosexual? 
And she said, yes, and why are you bothering him? That philosophy is at the core of every parent and every family member. So I don't wanna forget siblings or cousins or aunts, uncles, grandparents. It's more, more than parents, but it's parents plus. And what you see is people who love their families fiercely in the same way that shouldn't feel odd to anyone. It's making sure that their families are protected and that their family situations and strifes are understood by others and explained by allies who I think are the most important part of our conversations. We often say nothing about us without us, which I believe is true. I don't always need other people to speak for me, but it's really helpful to have speak people speak with us because the people that we need to convince to support the LGBTQ plus people are not LGBTQ plus people for the most part themselves. So our allies are our bridge to connection to folks who are not like us. I love, I love that, that statement, uh, yes, and, and why are you bothering him, right? Yes, and why are you, you could say that about somebody who is black and jogging through a neighborhood. You could say that as somebody who is Latin Hispanic or Jewish or Asian or, or uh, trans, right? Yes, and why are you bothering them? Why does identity, why does a different religion become a target is, is really the question in America. And I guess uh, for me, it seems that each of our uh, polit political philosophies actually is, is we, might, we might have separate political philosophies, but there should be something that brings us together, which is basically yes, right? Why, and why are you bothering that person? We just took a poll and um, we, it, it was a very, it was kind of a gimme poll. Uh, do you support 100% equality for members of LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community? And the answer of course um, ended up being yes. Let's, uh, let's move on to, uh, to PFLAG's uh, discussion because we're going to take some more polls in a second. Let's, let's uh, move on to discussion of PFLAG's uh, programs. Could you just sort of unpack the various programs that you have in order to advance this idea of America, yes, and people should be able to live the way they want to live. Absolutely. Well, I think it's one of the reasons I've been at Peep Flag for eight years, and I, one of the greatest joys is that we are nonpartisan. Peep Flag is a 501c3 nonprofit, and that means that we are we do not discuss candidates or parties we don't lean right or left we really are for the advocacy and the support of, of people so p flag has three legs they have support which is mostly the support groups that you see and know about over all of these decades that still exist but then we also have education we have two legs to that communicate that education part of that education is with corporations businesses hospital systems and the like that we have a program called straight for equality and straight for equality is actually teaching entities and people and entities how to be more welcoming and how to serve either as employees or as vendors or as customers lgbtq plus people and the third part is advocacy p flag always has to leave room for the most conservative of conservative people to find out one day that someone in their family is LGBTQ+, have room to love that person and have a place to go to get support, to know how to express that love. And that place is PFLAG. So that's why we're being nonprofit is so extremely important. But our civil rights work is done through our advocacy lens. And that has to do with shaping policy, but also shaping things like school policies, making sure students are safe at school as well as that people are, are welcome and safe in their communities. I think, I, I think it's such an important point, right? This whole idea of nonpartisan, if you focus on how America should be, America shouldn't be a partisan place, right? It shouldn't be about political parties. It should really be about core values. And what you're, what you're saying is, come, if you, if you are, um, the most liberal of liberal or the most conservative or of conservative libertarian, whatever your philosophy is, come because this whole idea of acceptance, you're accepted too. So let's let's listen, let's talk, let's let's have a discussion. Let's hear you out, hear us out, right? I mean, that's the way the country should work. 
in terms of, of, of encountering people who are opposed to this idea of the country, how do you interact with them? Because there are people who just won't listen and who also will try to shout you, shout you down, attack you, do the kind of things that basically nullify your voice. How do you, how do you interact in that way? Um, are you just a, an organization that uh, discusses uh, to death and, and just tries through goodwill? to win people over when the will is not good? How do you encounter there? So I have seen this in action. I will tell you, it's one of the great beauties and joys of PFLAG is that we're a grassroots network. We are made up of more than 400 chapters across the country, more than a quarter of a million supporters and members. And each of them owns something that, that I've brought in name called the power of the zip code it is something that i when i came i named it but it's always been the way of p flag which is the most influential people to legislators or an owner of a corner grocery store are the people who share zip codes with them a legislator does not have to listen to someone in washington dc they have to listen to someone who shares a zip code in their state or if they're representative in their district. How we do it with, is through expressing stories of our experiences. And part of our PFLAG Academy online learning teaches people to tell their story in two minutes. And it's done by our education team, our learning team in our, in our Straight for Equality Learning and Inclusion Network. But every PFLAGer is able to learn to tell their story in two minutes so that you can influence someone in a quick moment, but doing it in a way that tells them what your experience or your hopes are, but finding it through empathy, not through sympathy, but finding a way for people to share with with you to feel with you and be able to bridge to people who are extremely not always welcoming people either have self-love or family love it's one of the things that everyone shares no matter what that family or self are like and it's one of the ways that we appeal is through people's lived experiences and the courage of people making sure they're safe where they're telling the story when it's safe we tell but being able to share that quickly and effectively with people who may not know what it is that you've gone through. So this is a kind of an evangelism in which you are sharing experiences. You're, you're looking at this through the eyes of love. You're not looking at it through the eyes of conflict. And you also have a very sophisticated communication strategy. So it's, it's, it's really, um, it really seems to be more of a, a question of, of trying to figure out what connects us and creating um, uh, people who can evangelize for this idea, but you're not necessarily evangelizing for a particular legislative outcome, are you? It depends. We're, we actually are advocating for equality and equal and fair treatment and safety of individuals. So yes, we want the outcomes, including things like the Equality Act at a federal level, which would protect LGBTQ plus people in a variety of areas from employment to credit to even things like jury service. You would think that everyone believes that they can be on a jury of their peers or have a jury of their peers in assessing them. But LGBTQ people People are not included in that fairness. Let's uh, talk but, about let's talk about that. So does sure. that mean that that depending on what state I live in or what county I live in, that and and you and I living together as neighbors, I could serve on a jury, but you would be deprived of that right. I could be deprived by of it by someone who ex, who excuses me simply because of LGBTQ status. Yes, that's really interesting. So. So basically, you're, you would not be, if somebody were to target people who were, um, who were members of the LGBT community, and that became known, right, then you could be excluded. Could you be excluded from employment? Yes. Employment, public education, housing, uh, a variety of things that uh, normal people would consider just part of what the world offers. So um, that, that, that provides a logical underpinning for being in the closet, for being undercover, right? 
Why is it important that people not be undercover? Well, we may, I may differ and we may differ at PFLAG with that. It's only, we only believe that you should be disclosed or out if it is safe. We don't, we think that we hold the burden to make the world safer and better so that it's always okay for people to be out or disclosed. But we don't encourage people to take personal risk of personal harm or personal uh, danger for the sake of being part of an, uh, an out community. However, someone who's not out can certainly be part of the ally engagement and not be disclosed. So there's always a way for everyone to be included and be fully included, but we never encourage people to do anything that's dangerous. Well, you also were very careful in terms of, of our own write-up of your own biography that you were the first openly uh, out uh, trans person who was, a, who was a legislative aide and also openly out uh, to be part of the platform committee of the Democrat, it was the DNC, right? The, the DNC, but Correct. you were very careful because you said, uh, you know, we don't know if other people have not been uh, open, um, but we're still uh, 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 representative. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting educational moment uh, for, uh, for me, uh, of course. Uh, we just completed a couple of uh, polls. I'm going to read them out in a second. Right now we're taking another poll. Uh, it would be great if everybody please, uh, please responded to it. Um, in terms of, of going forward, in this uh, struggle. What do you think the most important milestones that we will be facing in the next uh, couple of uh, months uh, will be? I think milestones and opportunities. I think that the, one of the big milestones for us first is to uh, move forward with the Equality Act. We had great progress through the House. It passed on a bipartisan basis. We're now doing uh, conversations with uh, senators in order to get to the numbers that we need of voting yes. And we also want to make sure that people are able to know more people's stories of their own constituents so that they can hear that. The opportunity is to be involved by telling your story to people who are influential and picking up the phone. If you're not in one of the states that's being targeted right now, one of the 33 states where trans people especially are being targeted for sports participation, healthcare, and also public documents, record, records like driver's licenses, birth certificates. If you don't live in those states, find out where they are. Look at us at pflag.org and go to our advocacy area. You can see where those states are. And if you know someone there, if you went to school with people who are in those states, if you have family there, former coworkers, bring them up and ask them to be involved so that they can use the power of their zip code on you with your influence in places where they don't live. So we just uh, completed two polls. I, I said I would, would uh, unpack the results. I, I found it to be really interesting. We asked first, uh, where do you prioritize LGBTQ plus civil rights specifically? Uh, urgent priority in the top 10 priorities, important or not a huge priority. And what, what was interesting was that 25% felt that it was urgent, 38% um, felt that it was in the top 10 uh, priorities. So we have a, a uh, 60, uh, 66, basically two thirds majority saying it's, it's in one of the top 10 priorities. But what I, what I really think was interesting here is given the, uh, the audience that we have, there seems to be um, an understanding that the, the, th the threat level that previously existed when you and I were younger, Diego, has subsided somewhat, and it's now become a matter of, of urgency, but um, no longer um, a, a matter of threat. And then we said, how do, you, how do you support the modern civil rights movement? And we asked um, how people um, sort of stay involved. And one is by staying involved through social media, sharing information, voting, and through career and work choices. What I thought was interesting there was it sort of integrated more into our lives that the, the whole idea of, of having to be 100% dedicated to a particular cause is 
as, as things get better, as there's more embrace, uh, people can integrate that behavior in, in their daily uh, work ethic. Do you feel like we've made progress as a country to that extent where we can just be and also be advocates, be and also be uh, fighters for rights? How, how do you view the, pr the progress that we've made over the last 40 years? I feel that it varies by zip code. We have an epidemic level of transgender women being murdered. It's growing every year. We are just on June 1st, and we're already on pace to set a yet another record year of people being murdered simply because they're mostly Black trans women. I also think that right now we have, uh, I think, five or six states and with more at risk because more state legislatures are in, in action of kids being not able to receive proper medical interventions for being transgender, that their parents are criminalized and that their medical providers are criminalized. So I think that uh, the, the, the false aura of marriage made everything okay, it only made people sharpen their weapons and target particular people. And sadly, those people are people of color, transgender people, non-binary people. The, the, the target has become more sharpened. And I think that the obligation extends to those who feel more protected, that they should use that extra protection to protect those who become more exposed. It's such an interesting point. So in earlier times, people um, all over the country might have been afraid to do, uh, to do anything, to be revealed. Uh, now there are certain zip codes, there are certain areas where um, there is more safety, but there's still a huge road to hoe uh, going forward. And that's really what the Equality Act is about. Can we, uh, we're coming to the end of our time, but I wouldn't want to leave this discussion without talking about um, something that was in your bio that I found really interesting with resonance today of the spate of laws that are against uh, uh, young people um, who are trans serving on the different athletic teams. Could you just talk a little bit about, um, about uh, your, your um, athletic career uh, earlier in tennis and how you lettered? And then um, let's talk just very briefly about your views of, of, of those initiatives going forward. So I'll say that it was extremely painful anytime that I played tennis somewhere that I had to wear a dress, which was true at work. So it wasn't a unique experience uh, until I was able to change dress codes for work. I was never able to change dress codes for tennis, but I always found clubs that would let me not have to wear a dress. Um, it is emotionally painful to have to be forced into identity when you are not that. And so I feel very much with trans athletes. I was not able to compete as a man or as a boy. However, I did play tennis with boys and I always trained with boys. Um, and it wasn't about hormones, it was just about skill level, to be honest. I feel very much with people who are being targeted and eliminated from participating in sports in any way, because it is a good way for people to learn to work with others, to, to deal with defeat within themselves. And it's just a normal part of growing up that's being erased from an awful lot of trans people for a reason that has nothing to do with who they are and nothing and only to do with other people's imaginary fears, none science based. So you played on on uh, on tennis teams before you transitioned. You were forced to um, identify and wear clothing that you were not comfortable in. If I were to uh, apply that to myself, if I had to wear a dress. Right, um, and and I didn't want to wear a dress. I would have had to wear a dress in that in in that kind of a circumstance. You lettered, and then you transitioned. Um, in in today's world, what's what what I find to be very interesting in today's world, um, we have these these spate of of laws that seems to be um, really designed to just attack people. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to change anything in terms of the realities of, of who competes, but it seems to be stigmatizing and systemically stigmatizing people 
for um, for their identity. To me, it, it it's it's has some resonance of forcing people to wear a yellow star, uh, or in some way uh, signify so that um, you know everybody knows uh, who is going to be stigmatized and and not. How does it appear to you? Well. I, I'm glad you said that. For me, my mother was a concentration camp survivor and then married an American soldier who was a war hero in World War II and then moved to the United States. And yet, decades later, had to watch Rat Patrol, Combat, all those shows that totally erased the presence or participation of all German people and just cast them all as Nazis. I am not saying that this situation is exactly like that, but I take it to the personal feeling level. The way that my mother never ever complained and actually watched combat and rat patrol because American soldiers are who saved her life. Mm -hmm. The stigmatization that people felt when they watched those programs is something that when I rewatch those now, which I still do, I think about the difference of the same experience of what is being watched is received in such different ways by different audiences. And I do think that when people are targeted without, without any knowledge of who those people are, hurting families, making parents think that they may have to move from a state because their kids can't get life-saving, medically appropriate health care is wrong. And there's no other way to see it. Well, Diego Sanchez, thank you so much for sharing your own personal experience. We're so very grateful. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of fortitude to, to, uh, to help educate uh, people like myself. Um, thank you so much for your work as Director of Advocacy Policy and Partnerships at PFLAG. And, uh, and thank you for uh, pushing for rights, uh, your rights, are my rights. That it, that's really important uh, to this country. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it.